The owner of the New York Mets wrote a very cryptic tweet. Is Buck Showalter about to be fired? You are locked on MLB. Your daily MLB podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello, baseball fans, and welcome to Locked On MLB, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. This is the daily podcast. We talk about all of Major League Baseball. I'm your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. Look at my lower third. You can call me Sully. I'm an Emmy-nominated television producer who has been a baseball podcaster for the last decade or so, and this is my fifth season here at the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. Follow us at Locked On MLB Pods on Twitter and Instagram. I'm your pal Sully. I'm with Sully Baseball on Twitter, Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. And today's episode was being dropped on the 28th day of June, 2023. We're sponsored by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On MLB for $20 off your purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. All right. Um, a bunch of things to uh, talk about uh, in today's episode, not the least of which is the weird tweet from the owner of the New York Mets. But first, let's figure out who got the trivia question right. A couple of you did. Uh, the first one who came in uh, was, I believe it was Amy again. Let's see, was it uh, was it Amy again? Yeah, Amy Green, once again. First one in there. The uh, The question was, who was the first San Diego Padre to ever lead the league in home runs? And the answer was Fred McGriff. Fred McGriff, Hall of Famer Fred McGriff. Okay, let's go to the weird tweet, shall we? Um, I was uh, talking with a friend of mine, and they asked me, did you see what Steve Cohen tweeted? And the answer was no, because despite the fact that I do tweet a lot of stuff on my account, uh, I'm not always on there. So Steve Cohen, which was at Stephen A. Cohen 2, apparently someone else got Stephen A. Cohen 1, wrote uh, a, roughly around noon on uh, the other day saying, I will be doing a press conference tomorrow before the game. You'll get it from me straight. Okay. What does that mean? Seriously. Now, here's the funny thing. A lot of you are going to be hearing this show, you know, sometime, you know, you'll download in the morning, maybe in the afternoon, you'll be listening to it. And so you'll already know. You'll already know. So I'm getting my thoughts on this right now. It's about midnight on the 27th. We're about to turn the 28th at one point. I'm trying to get my thoughts in here. Now, the New York Mets have not been a good team this year and it's a strange situation because they seem to have all the pieces we've talked about all off season they seem to have all the pieces there and steve it's not been a lack of aggression from steve cohen who's been putting his money where his mouth is and they won 100 games last year and made the postseason a lot of people try to categorize what happened with the Mets last year as a collapse, and I disagree. Yes, they had a, what, a six, seven game lead over Atlanta with about a month and a half to go, and Atlanta wound up catching the Mets. But that wasn't a collapse because the Mets actually for those final bunch of weeks were playing winning baseball. It wasn't like they were playing disastrous baseball. It's just the Braves were winning seven or eight out of 10 games every day, and the Mets were just playing winning ball. And so I don't. I never looked at last year as a collapse. It just was the Braves just played at an unbelievable pace. DeGrom left. Verlander came in. The team looked like they were going to be very, very good. And here we are. We're sitting, even with the win, uh, the Mets got a victory last night. Um, even with that victory, they are 16 games behind the Atlanta Braves the team that I thought they were to coin toss with going into the year. Uh, it's a 16 game difference, but probably more importantly and more relevant to the Mets. They're eight and a half games out of the last wild card spot. There are three wild card spots and they, they trail Los Angeles by eight and a half and the pirates, Padres, Cubs, Brewers, and Phillies all 
and and Cubs. Jeez, there's, yeah, there's six team. Uh, no, there are five teams that are ahead of them, but they would have to pass all five of those and Los Angeles. So that's why they have to they have to leapfrog six teams to get the last wild card spot, eight and a half games back, and spiraling. Now they're spiraling. And, of course, a lot of that attention has been put. There have been injuries. There have been underachievers. There's been stretches where there's been no Pete Alonso. Stretches where there's no Verlander. Stretches where there's no Scherzer. You know, Lindor has been up and down. But the thought process seems to have been that this is a message that Showalter's job is on the line. Remember Buck Showalter? He won the manager of the year last year. He had also won the manager of the year previously with the Yankees, Rangers, and Orioles. Four different teams he's been the manager of the year for. You had to go all the way back to 2022 to see the last time he got that award. Now, I have a difficult time thinking that Buck Showalter went from being the best manager in the National League to firing material in six months. I have, a, I, I, have a, I have a tough time wrapping my head around that. But there have been instances where you've had solid managers on a team that it's just not working. Is Buck Showalter the problem with this team? I, I, I don't think so. But it's also very difficult to be in a situation where the team that has the highest payroll in the history of the game uh, can't put a winning product on the field. So if he was going to give the vote of confidence to Buck Showalter, he would have said that. Buck is our manager. You know, sent out a tweet saying, Buck Showalter is our manager. We're going to see this through. All Met fans are repeating like a mantra the fact that the last three World Series played in a full 162-game season, not counting the, the, the COVID year, Though the last three uh, World Series from full seasons, 2019, 2021, 2022, a National League East team had represented the National League in each one of those World Series. And in each one of those years, they had had a losing record at this point in the season. Washington in 2019, Atlanta in 2022, Philadelphia last year. So the Mets are thinking, hey, they have the talent. They could still make a run. And two of those teams, Washington and Last year's Phillies team were wild card teams. Hell, the Phillies became the first third place team to go to the World Series last year. So, you know, there is that rays of hope that they have there. But then why not say that? Why not say Buck Showalter is our manager? Buck Showalter is the manager of the year last year. We, if we are going to have a turnaround like that, it will need a strong skipper like Buck Showalter. Didn't say that. And, of course, it's coming off of a couple of disastrous losses, including one which had a full Mets bullpen collapse, of which Showalter didn't go to some of his best relievers during a collapse. And this is a time where the Mets just have to start piling up saves. There's no style points. You know, there's no, you, you know, there's no moral victories. There's no, like, oh, they, they won, but it was, uh, you know, it was an ugly win. It's it's binary at this point. You gotta just you gotta just climb back at least to five hundred and see where you can go there. Will firing Buck Showalter accomplish anything? Well, it would appease the sharks in the water who wanted to do something. The Met fans who are outrageously disappointed at this point, and rightfully so. But is that truly going to solve something? And there's another sort of beacon that is going on there. And I'm going to talk about Shohei Otani in the third segment of today's show because, I mean, he's, he just did something. He's just showing why he, there's no amount of money that he can't ask for at this point. But if you're going to try to make the Mets a uh, impressive landing spot for someone like Otani, you know, with some money coming off the books and everything like that, they're, they're obviously going to be very aggressive. But you probably shouldn't have your team in a situation where they look like they're in complete turmoil if you want to attract big-time free agents to come there. 
Now, of course, money talks. And it doesn't matter. You could be, it could be an absolute battle zone. It could look like the last chopper out of Saigon. And if you give someone a big enough contract, they will come. But will that ever be the Rubik's Cube that will lead for the Mets' first championship since the Rubik's Cube was relatively new? The cryptic message. I think he's going to be fired. I don't agree with firing him. But, you know, we saw last year Girardi's firing may have loosened up the Phillies as they you know went on to the World Series. But is Showalter the issue? Is Showalter the problem? Yes, you can point to individual games where the bullpen wasn't held, you know, managed well. You could do the same thing for all throughout Joe Torre's career. You, Terry Francona has made strange decisions out of the bullpen. I remember watching Giants games with my late father when he would be watching him and they just hear him go, boach, 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 because he didn't agree with the move. Hell, Dusty Baker's going to the Hall of Fame. He's made all sorts of bizarre bullpen choices up until last year's World Series championship. So I, I, that can't be the reason. They're underachieving, but I mean, is that all on him? But I do think it's going to happen. Because why would you do that? Why would you just, why would you send out, I'm going to say something, I'm not saying what it is. When enough people, when enough Met fans are furious and smell blood, but you can't acquire Otani yet. They're not going to make a big trade right now. They're not going to trade for Trout or someone who would be a big difference maker. Now, who would you hire? You know what I, you know, I've been screaming for bringing in one of Bruce Bochy's lieutenants. Take a shot, everyone, because I think that's just smart. I don't think firing Buck Showalter is the right move because, quite frankly, I don't think he's the problem. And I think that would create a sense that the Mets are a team scrambling and in turmoil and panicking. And you could argue maybe now is the time to panic. But the fact of the matter is this. When the owner is being that coy, that cryptic, and is creating a story based on him going tippy-tap, tippy-tap, send, you know he's on the verge of doing something that's kind of drastic. Whether or not it's the right thing to do, well, that's the topic of another story. But do you know what? It's not my team. I'm not a billionaire. Well, it's baseball time. Now's the time to get your tickets. I'm going to be buying some San Francisco Giant tickets pretty soon. And it should not be a stressful occurrence when you're trying to buy tickets to the ball game. And I think the best route to go is to use game time. Buying tickets shouldn't be stressful. Game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. With killer deals on last-minute tickets and their best price guarantee, you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for all the fun you're going to have. They got easy-to-find tickets. You could buy them, and the images from the seats, you can see them right from the app. Oh, that's a good view. That's where I want to sit. Boom, clickety-click, lowest price guaranteed, event cancellation protection, job loss protection, etc. Now, the game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. Buy tickets in a matter of seconds. Two taps, you're set. Tickets will be sent directly to your phone, so you don't have to dig through your emails. So snag the tickets without the stress with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use code locked on MLB for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code locked on MLB for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. I'm here in the San Francisco Bay Area for a few weeks, and right across the bay from where I'm sitting, the lame duck Oakland A's were playing the nominal New York Yankees. Um, look, at, uh, we just talked a little bit about the Mets. And who is to blame there? I, I, and again, I don't think Showalter should be the scapegoat. But um, 
I can talk long and about why I don't understand why Brian Cashman has been getting away scot free of putting you know not putting a championship caliber team on the field for the New York Yankees, uh, but a, a truly embarrassing loss happened to, for the New York Yankees yesterday. They lost two to one to the Oakland A's. Now. Every team's going to win. Every team's going to lose. I mean, it's, I mean, it's not the end of the world. But the disturbing thing is the by virtually every metric, the A's have the worst pitching staff in baseball, and the A's won two to one, and it was a solo home run by Josh Donaldson, who was in a grotesque slump. That was the only thing that kept it from being a shutout, and. You know, Josh Donaldson is may be designated for assignment soon. They may, they may just have to eat the cost of him because he just his 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 hitting numbers are like sinking to the bottom of the ocean, and his fielding has. I mean, that was that was his saving grace supposedly, and he's not been fielding well. He offers nothing to the team. The fact that he was benched and he was not happy about being benched. I'm like, well, you can't hit, you can't field. Why should you be playing every day? But the fact of the matter is Aaron Judge is out. And it's not 100% clear how long he's going to be out. Listen to Stacey Gatsoulias on Locked on Yankees. And they're not, they're not trusting. Neither Steve nor Stacey are trusting the Yankees are being honest about what's going on with the team. But then you take a look just at the rest of the production of the lineup. Aaron Judge out. Okay, that happens. But then you see that Stanton is, I mean, it's not just that he's been, you know, injury prone and everyone knew that he was going to be injury prone. But they're having a hard time finding, you know, Stanton's batting under like 200 since Judge has been gone. Up and down the lineup, all the people that they've had to count on have OPSs that nobody is approaching 600 with their OPS. You know, for those of you who don't know what that means, an OPS is combining the on-base percentage of your slugging. And an excellent OPS would be in the 900s. A pretty good one would be in the 700s. When you get lower than that, it's pretty bad. And everyone is hitting OPSs in the last few weeks under 600. And they're not getting, you look up and down their lineup. When you're seeing, I mean, when you just look at the lineup that they're putting out there, I'm going to go to the MLB app right now, and I'm going to just sort of just take a quick peek. Um, I had it up on my computer. My computer is freezing up right now. So I've got to grab my phone. i got to grab my, my, my trusted smartphone. I'm not going to say the brand because they are not a, uh, uh, a sponsor on this podcast. But, I mean, if you go up and down the Yankee lineup, LeMayhew's, you know, another offer, and you know his average is 227. His his OPS is in the 600s. Kind of Falefer's average is in the 230s. His OPS is under seven. Um, the only ones with OPS is above the you know, above seven. You know, Bader, Rizzo, but Rizzo's been slumping. Um, Stanton's numbers are embarrassing. Uh, Donaldson should be cut. Um, you know, Bowers in a short period of time has hit well, but I mean, but you know, a terrible batting average, you know, you've had some people like McKinney has done well in a short period of time, but everyone else, Volpe's an automatic out, Trevino's an automatic out, Gashioka's an automatic out. I mean, that's a, that's a, a spring training split squad lineup that I just said right now. And they are getting decent pitching. Brito pitched well today. He held the A's to two runs pitching into the sixth. He gave them some innings, and they got two runs, okay? Against the worst pitching staff in baseball, you think you can score three. And this is all because in the game of Jenga, removing Aaron Judge from this lineup has, this team has collapsed. They are a losing team without him. 
yes, it's always rough when you lose a superstar. Okay? And Aaron Judge won the MVP. But you shouldn't turn into a sub-500 team, no matter who you lose. Obviously, the, you know, the Braves lost Ronald Acuna in 2021 and went on to win the World Series. And this goes right back to Cashman. This goes right back to the construction of this team. Remember, the teams were playing footsie, trying to, you know, the Giants were trying to acquire Aaron Judge. The fact of the matter is this. The, the Yankees are in a position where if they don't have Aaron Judge, they're, forget a pennant contender, they're not even a wild card team. Now, as it stands right now, the Yankees remain a wild card team. As it stands right now, where we're almost exactly at the halfway mark of the season, the Yankees are 43 and 36, 544, which is tied with the Angels for the second wild card spot. Now, they're only a half a game ahead of Toronto and only one game ahead of Houston. So it would take a modest losing streak for the Yankees and a modest winning streak from the Angels, Blue Jays, and Astros to have the Yankees fall out of the wild card race. Again, with half the season left to play. But if you're if if Judge is going to be injured for any length of time, be if, if Judge is not back by the all-star break, if they're going to be looking at July, where there's a possibility you don't have Judge for July, is this a playoff team? And what does this say about the construction of the squad? What does this say? about how they, you know, reaching into the minor league system, be able to find some to fill in the hole, that they put together a team that if you lose one player, it, the team collapses. I've mentioned this before, but the last time I saw this with a team was Barry Bonds. When you put Barry Bonds on the Giants in the, uh, not in the 90s and in the 2000s, they were a playoff contender. When you removed them, they were a legitimately bad team. Is that what the Yankees have become? They've the 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 biggest superstar that they've developed since the complete retiring of the core is you know, they they develop one superstar and that's it. And you know, forget talking about firing Cashman and forget even talking about firing uh, uh, for firing Showalter or Boone. This is Cashman at this point. You can't go around still taking victory laps for 98, 99, and 2000, a team that Cashman was involved in the construction of, of course, but he did inherit a team that was built by Stick Michael and Bob Watson. If you look at Cashman, when he took complete control of the team, was in 2006. That's when the Levines and the Tampa office had to back off and Cashman was going to run the ship. Since 06, which, by the way, is approaching 20 years ago, they've gone to one World Series, and they won it a year where they went on a spending spree, bringing in Sabathia and Burnett and uh, Teixeira. But once you've removed the great team that he inherited, think about that. By the time Rivera and Posada and Jeter, and even Alex Rodriguez were all retired. And, of course, there was this great symbolism that A-Rod was basically cut from the team, and Aaron Judge came up the next day in 2016, okay, which was, what, seven years ago. In seven years, they've developed one superstar. In seven years, they've made a very good acquisition for Garrett Cole. And then what? What have they developed in seven years, nearly two presidential terms? They've created a team with one legitimate superstar that you can't take away from, drafted well, developed well, and he's done everything you've wanted him to do. But in that stretch of time, you've built a team that if he's not on it, they're a sub-500 team that can't score three runs off the A's. 
I'm sorry. Why would, why would he still have a job? Why? I need someone to answer me that. Because when you take a look, you can't keep pointing to the core that he inherited. His core is what? Gary Sanchez? Luis Severino is hurt all the time. You know, I mean, they've put together some decent, like Clay Holmes was a nice trade, but it's not like he's Mariano or even Keith Folk. He's had his ups and downs. The pitching's been okay. But you can't construct a lineup with major leaguers? This is not a major league lineup that they have. And guess what? Let's assume the Yankees are not making the World Series this year. Okay? They'll go into next year knowing that they would have had 20 seasons with one pennant and one title. And this coming from the team where that's supposedly the standard. It isn't anymore. It isn't anymore. And for Yankee fans, you have to be a little bit worried that the complacency of, eh, we're going to be a wild card team, that that seems to be, that seems to be okay. This team is poorly constructed. This team has a farm system where they can't find major leaguers who are ready. And there are not enough major leaguers in the lineup to hit. And the person who constructed that team has had the car keys since, God, before the Star Wars prequels came out. Okay, if we're going to do it by, uh, you know, if we're going to do it by pop culture, you know, I mean, there are people being drafted now who were, you know, who were drafted, who were born in like 2003 or 2004. These are people who don't know what, you know, the Yankee greatness means, except in old black and white films. They've put together a lineup that if you take out the superstar, it is incompetent. They have a losing record without Judge. They can't hit without Judge. The complimentary players are totally lost without Judge. Judge is a great player, but there's no one player on the planet who could be the entire team. And that's completely on Cashman. You want to talk about firing Showalter? Someone write to me and give me a legitimate reason why Cashman is still employed. By the way, um, there was a, a crossroads of two teams who were playing in Anaheim for the last couple of days. The White Sox have lost the two games to the Angels. Um, they had a walk-off game the other day. They scored on a wild pitch. On uh, Tuesday, the uh, the White Sox you know, lost another game to the Angels. Another, it got another close game. It was 4-2. to two. But in the end, it was... It was the Shohei Otani show. I'm going to bring up the White Sox briefly because, you know, technically they're only six games out of first place. And the team that's in first place has a losing record. So it's not like there's a great team running away with the AL Central. And you can say, you know what, if we have a decent month, you can make up six games pretty quickly. But they're also, they're, their winning percentage is 420. You can do whatever you want with that number. But they are a legitimately bad team. And they have a bunch of trade chips on their team, of pitchers on their team, whether it's Cease or, you know, uh, whether it's Giolito. You know, the up and down their staff, they have a couple of decent pitchers, of which they, if they bundled those together, they'd be able to get a decent prospect back because the team would be able to say, hey, we have instant pitching depth. This was a gut check weekend for them. If they had won a couple of games and had crawled back to within four games of the division, even a lousy division, you'd almost have to say, well, let's go for it. What the heck is going to happen? 
But if you're sitting here going like, no, we're just they're they're they've had a losing record in the last ten games, and they're inching closer. They're 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 closer to four hundred than they are to five hundred. And it's going to be in three days. It's going to you know it's going to be July in three days. So these losses may just have to hold up the mirror to the White Sox and say, you got to stop. It's not going to happen. But an interesting thing about last night's game, you know, the Angels um, uh, you know, got everything from Shohei Otani yesterday. Shohei Otani had one of those games that just makes you shake your head. I mean, he he won his seventh game. I'm not a big believer in looking at win-loss record. That doesn't tell you much anything. Um, his he lowered his ERA to 3.02. He pitched into the seventh. He allowed four hits, one run. He struck out ten. I mean, you ask that from any pitcher. And then at the plate, he got on base four times, homering twice. He owned baseball. I can't figure out if it's as a pitcher or as a hitter. It's a combination of the two. He is. I mean, his home run totals, he's going to, he has a legit shot at 50 home runs this year. His, uh, if you like batting average, he's batting 304. If you like OPS, his OPS is over 1,000. And he's an innings eating pitcher who had to leave because he had a, a cracked fingernail. Okay, he'll be fine. He'll be fine. Um, the next five weeks are the most critical weeks in the history of the Angels. I, and that includes the year they went to the World Series in 2002 because they have two generational stars on their team. They have Mike Trout, the best player of of his generation, and they have the single most interesting talent we may have ever seen in baseball. Have we seen better pitchers? Yes. Have we seen better hitters? Yes. But we've never seen a quality pitcher who's going to wind up hitting 50-some on home runs unless you do go back to freaking Babe Ruth. And if a team needs a quality pitcher and a big bat, yeah, he can ask for the moon and the stars. He can ask for $500 million. Do you know why? Because if you're going to bring in a superstar hitter and offer them a $250 million contract and then sign a superstar pitcher and offer them a $250 million contract, yeah, that'd be a lot, but no one would be shaking their head at it. And now you get both and you only take up one roster spot. That in itself, that you have both of them and uh, we can still fill another roster spot. Boom. Boom. And did I mention, boom. And what he did tonight just showed once again, he can ask for whatever he wants. Now, as it stands right now, he is currently on the Angels. And it's the likelihood of the Angels getting him on a hometown discount is zero. Because he will ask for the sun, the moon, and the stars, and he will get them. And they may even throw in a galaxy or two to be named later. So the angels now have to fill in their holes and say, you can win a championship with us. Now, the angels are five games behind the Texas Rangers right now. They are tied with the Yankees for the second wildcard spot. They trail the... Orioles by seven games and lost come for the first wildcard spot. But for these next few weeks, they have to fill in whatever holes and put together the ship. So by the time they get to the trade deadline, they can look around and say like, we have a team that can make the playoffs. And if we make the playoffs, we have a team that may be able to do well. They have to be able to look Shohei Otani in the eyes and say, you do have a chance to have your great moment and to do it in an angel's uniform because if he hits the free agent market he looks at the angels and say like we're never going to win there we don't have a chance of winning there where else can i go i think he's going to be a met next year i think absolutely think he's going to be with the mets and the mets have to clear up any of that weirdness that i mentioned in segment one so otani could feel like he's not going to walk into an absolute crazy reality show 
But these next four or five weeks are critical for the Angels to be able to say, hey, you can win here and let us show you how. Got to get to the playoffs, they're currently in a playoff position. You you know, bringing in Mustakas to fill in the hole at first, not a bad idea. They need another starter. They may need another bat. And the team that's currently in there right now should be the team they should be talking to. Cease, you know, Giolito, one of them, heading to the Angels to give them a little bit of that rotation depth might be the difference between playing in October or not. We started this year with a great Otani versus Trout face-off in the World Baseball Classic, and it was a lot of fun. And that's the stage that Otani wants to be on. If he can't do it with the Angels, he will go elsewhere. So these next four or five weeks, the direction of the Angels franchise might be on the line. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, the All-Star Game selection and upcoming show. And probably by the time we do the next show, we'll know what the hell the Steve Cohen tweet was all about. Hey, um, my trivia question for today. Let's see who can get this one. Um, the question is, who was the first Cy Young Award winner who began the season that he won in the other league? In other words, he won the Cy Young Award in the National League, but began the season in an American League team, or maybe it was vice versa. But it was a mid-season trade where they brought in the player who not only fit like a glove with the new team, but won the Cy Young Award in their new league. So tell me who that was. That is a trivia question. Send it to Locked On MLB Pods on Twitter and Instagram. My private account, which is Sully Baseball on Twitter, Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram, or do it here on the YouTube page for those of you who are watching us there. Talking about cryptic messages for the Mets organization. My personal incredulity of no upheaval in the Yankee organization and telling the Angels, you better get your act together if you want that big star to stick around. This has been Locked On MLB for the 28th day of June, 2023. I am your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. Please call me Sully.